What is art? Traditional and modern perspectives. If you were to ask one question that would guarantee a huge amount of argument between people, simply discuss the definitions of art. If one were to show someone not normally inside the art community some of the more avant-garde examples of modern art, you'd get a reply of, that's not art, I could make that myself. An investigation into this area is something that is long and often fruitless, but I thought before we delve deeper into understanding the culture of a society on this channel, we must seek some basic definitions. As part of this, I have taken a historical analysis of art up until the 19th century and contrasted it with a lecture that the modern artist Grayson Perry gave in 2014. The history of art is unsurprisingly tied to the history of civilization. Some of the earliest finds of man's footprints on the earth are in the form of items that we could say are artistic in nature. In archaeological terms, these are described as material culture. The pieces tend to either be items of utility that have been ornamented in some way, or something potentially connected to religion or ritual significance. Two examples displayed here are the famous Lion Man, carved out of a single piece of ivory in the Holsteinstadel Caves and dated to around 40,000 BC, or the Mammoth Spear Thrower, which is the only remaining part of the weighted end of a spear thrower that dates back to 16,000 BC. Both of these items would probably not have been tied to a specific artisan or dedicated craftsman, but to one of the hunter-gatherers that spent their nights whittling away from their imagination. These items and much of the material culture that remains are tied up with two important things, hierarchy and religion. Only the high status members of the groups would have used the ornamental items, and many statues seem to be created for the purpose of religion. This leads us to our first question. These are cultural objects, but are their makers artists, as they have no concept of creating art as we would understand it today? They are, so to speak, creating these objects in ignorance, but does that invalidate their creations? As agricultural methods move on, we see the rise of settlements, and with that, dedicated craftsmen, and the first true division of labour. Excess food supply leads to the creation of an elite class, and with the increased need for visual displays of hierarchy, craftsmen gain prominence, and we have the first true flourishing of art. The Old Kingdom of Egypt and Minoan cultures, both dating to around 3000 BC, are two kingdoms of particular prominence, where we can see classes of craftsmen congregating around specific forms of art, and we see significant steps in the techniques and mediums being used. These civilizations would answer our first question by stating that art is something that is consciously made by this artistic class. We can see some of the earliest frescoes, statues depicting rulers, and a huge amount of art with the purpose of supporting religious activity. Even though much of society has changed from the hunter-gatherer, the usage of these articles still revolves around hierarchy and religion. In most of these cases, art is produced by commission. Due to pressures on time and food, a craftsperson could not just outlay product and then attempt to sell it in the way like today, but only by being tasked to produce something. With the true birth of the craftsman, we are now presented with another question. Is everything that an artist creates art? For example, if we move on in time to the classical period, a Greek vase painter might produce something like this. This is a black figure vase from the Archaic period, showing the well-known scene of Ajax and Achilles playing a game, sometimes identified as dice. A commission of this prestige would have been for someone of renown, maybe even as a funeral commission. But what about a more humble commission like this? This vase, although not from the same painter, shows just how simple some of their commissions would have been. We've lost most of the ornamentation, any figurative elements, and are left with a single wreath of structured foliage around its neck. Is this art in the same way that the vase above would be considered? Speaking of the Greeks, it's during the classical period we start to hear the first definitions of the arts. One of the more detailed understandings come from what the Romans have passed down to us. To them, what we call art was broader and is derived from the understanding of a skill. There is one example of this which has been maintained in the modern lexicon, the art of war. Here we're not talking about the depictions of war, but the craft and skill of a master warmonger. The Romans declared the arts were either liberales or ingenui, that is, Arts of the freedman and arts of the slave. Here certain art forms are practiced by freedmen. Gymnastics, generalship, politics, eloquence, grammar, poetry, music, and are considered higher than those of the slave. All other arts, including painting, mosaic, and pottery. Note that the ingenui, or sordid arts as one could translate it, are the ones that require your body to produce. This again creates more questions. We can understand that there are strata of art between the quality of art, the work a child artist creates is usually worse than what his future self is capable of. But are there types of art or groups which are inferior to others by their very nature? The historical view believes so. When we come to the Renaissance, we see a consolidation of ideas about the arts and the emergence of what we would recognise today as an artist. Many of the craftsmen we have talked about so far would have not marked their own work and wouldn't have the same level of recognition as these Renaissance artists. 
Historians have considered that the innovations in the printing press and engravings which allow an artist to build up a name for himself outside of his locale, as well as the rise of the merchant class, created the ability for an artist to truly have a name for themselves. For example, Albert Durer, famous for his woodcuts and engravings, sent them all over Europe, increasing his reputation and demand for work. Vasari also contributed to the cult of the artist with his book, Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, where he lists out biographies of famous artists of the recent period. Note how he chooses these three areas of the arts, above others, in a differentiating way. These definitions over time become the foundation of a core grouping, which in the 17th century would be known as the fine arts. Michelangelo also leaves us with an interesting thought that, quote, carrying a box of colours did not make a painter. If art is something that is only produced by an artist, what is an artist? Michelangelo certainly seems to think that simply carrying out art, or at least looking like you do, does not make an artist. One of the definitions of art in the Merriman-Webster dictionary reads, skill acquired by experience, study or observation. According to this, an art is something that is acquired through practice, through the act of repetition. This seems to align with Michelangelo's thoughts, but simultaneously creates a circular reference. An artist becomes an artist through carrying out his art. Is it possible to resolve this paradox? In pottery, there's a saying, that you have to throw a thousand times to become a potter. When you start throwing, without doubt, the first attempts will be abortive almost immediately. After around 30 throws, you should be able to create something that will be recognisable as a bowl, and from that point, it's about refining that skill down. I went on a part-time ceramics course a while ago, and you can see this process at work. There are three bowls that I made during this course, one at the beginning, one at the middle, and one towards the end. The first bowl is a mess. I pulled the walls up too thin, too many times without enough water, and the walls ripped. But this bowl was the first thing I had which was even close to a successful shape, and so I kept it for posterity. The second looks more like a bowl, but the sides are rough where I was too severe when I was smoothing and adding the foot. Finally, after 60 throws, I managed to produce something respectable, and while it has many flaws in its shape and design, it marks progress. Through experience comes the artist. This notion of repetition was held through the various craft guilds which monopolised trade, even late into the 19th century. The guild process would start with a young man being enrolled as an apprentice. He would pay a fee and serve a certain number of years before his obligations would be lifted and would advance to the journeyman level, named for the daily wage that they would receive for their work. In some traditions they would be expected to travel around the country to gain a variety of experience and, after another fixed period of time, be allowed to produce a Meisterstuck or masterpiece, and only at that stage be allowed to create his own workshop. The last consideration of the historical view was the understanding of the value of art. This discussion around aesthetics is almost as contentious as the understanding of art itself. However, a summarised version would be that the historical artist was looking to instill in the object something that was beautiful, good or true. The item when viewed would then raise the passions inside of us. This idea of the passions is something quite apart from our modern understanding. Today when we talk about art, we constantly mention things in terms of their emotional impact. How does this make me feel? If the passions are not stirred when someone sees an object, it might be because the object is not beautiful. Equally, however, it might be that there is a flaw in our personality. We are missing something. We lack the sensibility to understand these hidden mercurial properties. The modern looks at an object and either likes it or dislikes it. There is never any fault with himself. The last consideration is the place of tradition on art. I'd like to break this item out into its own separate video at some point, but to summarise this complicated area, I think there are three areas of tradition that the historical artist taps into. The first is the scene. Now I say scene with a capital S, and mean it to be a motif that is used, but on a larger scale. We can see that the historical artist would be able to draw upon the traditions of their nation's school, or others, by making their art about a specific subject. For example, if we think of the Adoration of the Magi, this scene is used time and time again throughout different art periods. Symbology is important as well, where things shown in a picture have hidden meaning. Some of these symbols resonate with us now, but others lie well forgotten. We cannot mistake the meaning of the huge skull at the base of Holbein's ambassadors, but when we see da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine, we may miss that the ermine represents cleansing and purity to the Renaissance mind. Finally, techniques are devised and passed down through nations. Oil painting appears relatively late on the artistic scene and totally challenges the way that you can paint. Rather than the laborious building up of gradient via brush strokes that you're limited to with tempura painting, oils allow blending on the canvas, giving greater chances of realism. Each of these three traditions is passed down from artist to artist through an uninterrupted chain of learning and apprenticeship until a calamity happens and the knowledge is lost. By relying on the techniques of the master, the apprentice can stand on his shoulders. Hunt recants the following story, quote, 
Burne Jones, once conversing upon the shortness of human life for the attainment of maturity in art, impulsively said to me at least 300 years were needed. This, though an unpremeditated exclamation, was not a baseless guess. The Greeks, the Romans, and the Italians eked out their short span of personal observation and experience by handing on their acquired wisdom to their peoples, and so extended individual life, and thus more surely reached their goal of their ambition. Understanding the connection between the nation and tradition is hugely important, where, for example, scenes, symbols and techniques have different meanings and paths in different nations. Consider the colour yellow. In the Renaissance context, it's often associated with the figure of Judas, while in modern Thailand it's associated with riches and kingship, so much so that there's a royalist faction called the Yellow Shirts. A summary of the traditional view could be as follows. There must be a conscious effort in art's creation. Art is made by an artist who in turn is created through experience as part of a process. Art has a hierarchy depending on the forms used, although what that hierarchy is changes in moments of time. Art has transcendental qualities which live in the objects, which rouse the passions. Art is tied to tradition via scenes, symbols and techniques encompassed in nationality. Let us now look at a more recent period and analyse the thoughts of a modern. The first thing to note about the current situation in the art world is the impact that both modernism and postmodernism has had in understandings and the intellectual discourse. The Bauhaus, whose artistic training methodology has been adapted for schools today, look to re-evaluate the learning process and ultimately remove traditional understanding from all training. Postmodernists in their attempt to remove all meta-narrative aimed to deconstruct what art is, with, for example, Foucault saying, quote, What strikes me is the fact that in our society, art has become something which is related only to objects and not to individuals or to life. That art is something which is specialised or which is done by experts who are artists. But couldn't everyone's life become a work of art? Why shouldn't the lamp or the house be an art object, but not our life? To the postmodern mind, anyone can be an artist, and anything can be art. These notions have been embraced at a high level, but if we take them at face value and look at the current institutions, we can see there are inconsistencies. If anyone can be an artist, why have most exhibited modern artists gone to art school and spend all of their days creating art? If anything can be art, why are museums not filled up like old cabinets of curiosities with objects from all different parts of life, rather than the large stores of what is traditionally called art? There is a disconnect between what is spoken and what is done. Grayson Perry is a flamboyant and eccentric transvestite ceramic artist, drawing on both societal and craft narratives. In 2013, he was asked to give a series of lectures on the state of art, and what struck me at the time was their candid nature and how he identified that there were still unspoken boundaries to art. His first-hand experience is invaluable in deconstructing our current culture, and he begins thusly, quote, What many people regard as kind of the post-historical art world, the postmodern, the end of art, we're in a state now where anything goes but I think there are boundaries still about what can and cannot be art. But the limits are softer, they're fuzzier, and I think they're not formal. Anything can be art. I'm quite happy to engage with that intellectual idea, but I think the boundaries are sociological, tribal, philosophical, and maybe even financial. He rightly recognises that the gatekeepers of morality exist, and that while many people espouse postmodern virtues, the life they live is far from this. He then lays out what he believes these boundaries are in the form of several rules. Rule number one, is it in a gallery? or an art context. Now, Duchamp's urinal, he could have left it plumbed in, but no, he brought it into the gallery. In this test, we see the modern relying on the academy to show artistic worth. This is an appeal to authority of sorts, where proof relies in understanding. That is a base of tradition and learning. This is a view which is actually quite similar to what we've previously seen. It was other masters of a guild that would declare a masterwork. It was Vasari who chose to include, and more importantly, exclude from lives. The problem the modern has is that this view cannot be held up in both the postmodern and deconstructive narratives we see increasingly being espoused. Postmodernism fundamentally questions traditional understanding. The canon itself is refuted and tradition is abandoned. If this is the case, why should we listen to the tradition of the moderns? Why does this current academy have anything to offer us over anyone else? Another example is analysis of the post-colonial mindset, which considers the academy bastions of oppression. Their very existence is a tombstone to the repression of the other, and should be ultimately destroyed. Note how they will still use existing systems to achieve their goals, similar to a parasite which feeds and ultimately consumes its host. Rule number two is a boring version of something else. This test is very interesting and alerts us to one of the key tenets of modernism, that is, the holding up of novelty above all else. Why is it that when we step back from the world of art, we can see in the 20th and 21st centuries an explosion in the different forms being used in art? While the pinnacle of Victorian art was the oil painting, we see collage, film, video, digital performance, experiential, so many new forms being introduced. 
The reason is simple, and that's because the modern fears organic growth. Only the new thing will get them the attention that they deserve. The problem with novelty is that it's like taking a drug. With each hit, our resistance is built up further and further. The inevitable end of this is complete intellectual burnout. Rule number three. Is it made by an artist? Art historian Ernst Gombrich said, There is no such thing as art, only artists. So you have to be an artist to make art. Grayson leaves us hanging there slightly, connecting with some similar points from our historical analysis, but going no further. Luckily, he does let slip his thoughts in another one of his lectures. In reference to his flamboyant dress sense, he's asked the following question. You dressing up, is that art? No, is his reply. It's definitely not, because I choose it not to be art. Here, Grayson has the authority to decide what is and isn't art. Who is an artist? The one with the will to declare himself to be one. Number four, the limited edition test. Now this brings us to another interesting boundary post that can be applied to other artworks as well as photography, and that is the limited edition test. You know, because the reason that Gursky's photograph made $4.5 million is that it was an edition of five, and the others were already in the museum's collections, so would never be available. Here, there is a declaration that art has to have a limited nature to be legitimate. Again, there is an interesting parallel here with the historical analysis. Art has always been tied to elitism, but this focus is more on the form rather than with whom. Artists in the historical sense create objects on a commission basis, meaning that everything they make would be considered as fulfilling this limited edition rule. Rule number five, the handbag and hipster test. Another test that perhaps sounds facetious I have is what I call the handbag and hipster test. Quite often you can tell if something is a work of art apart from the people that are looking around at it. So there's lots of people with beards and glasses and single speed bikes or oligarch's wife with great big handbags looking a bit perturbed and puzzled at what they're staring at. Art, art it belongs to a sort of privileged people who've got a good education or a lot of money. So if those people are kind of staring at it, there's quite a high chance that it is art. This is a similar argument to the academic one, but instead of the institutions, Grayson is placing his trust in the current elite class. As we've discussed in my previous video, this view on what is good and what is bad is maintained by a current elite, which, as soon as they are usurped, is disturbed. If we showed a group of mid-century Victorians around Tate Modern, not only would they be disgusted, but they would not spend time staring at the art in the way that Grayson describes. Rule number six, the rubbish dump test. Now this is one of my tutors at college. He had this one. He said, if you want to test a work of art, he said, Throw it onto a rubbish dump, and if people walking by notice that's there, and say, oh, what's that artwork doing on that rubbish dump? It's past. This is an interesting test because it talks to the properties that the object has within it, and something that can be recognised without any kind of training or knowledge. This notion of the intrinsic value of art has not been managed to maintain itself through modernism, with millennials now saying that the only value art has is its monetary value. So to summarise his points, we have the following definition. There must be a conscious effort in art's creation. Art is made by an artist, who is in turn selected by academy, elites, or themselves. Art has a hierarchy depending on the forms being used, although what that hierarchy is changes depending on its limited nature. Art has transcendental qualities which live in the objects and which taps into our emotions. Art is tied into creativity and novelty, untethered to the past and made for the global citizen. I think it's interesting just how similar these ideas of the artist are, however wrapped up in postmodern pretensions. The three key deviations are around understanding who the artist is. The moderns place value on societal reputation. Whoever goes through the correct channels will be validated. The move from the passions to emotions is another key differential and ultimately crystallises itself in subjectivism, where one person's feelings has the same power as any others. But of course, the large difference is in the pull of novelty on the modern art world. Artists work to outdo one another with shock and uniqueness, but as time goes on, the power of shock decreases. As a closing remark, I'm reminded of a passing comment by the play Art by Yasmina Reza. The play depicts a turbulent relationship between three friends, focused around one of the friends, Serge's, buying a piece of expensive abstract contemporary art. Mark, whose taste allies with the traditional, has this to say. I don't believe in the values which dominate contemporary art. The rule of novelty, the rule of surprise. Surprise is dead meat, Serge. No sooner conceived than dead.